Yo, what is going down? Welcome to Show Me the Meaning Wisecracks Movie Podcast. Show me the meaning! All right, I am Austin Hayden. I, I like how Ryan, for people who can't see the live stream, Ryan just gave a Show Me the Meaning and then he kind of shrugged it off like he wasn't impressed with himself. I thought that was a good one. That I was like say, a very you know, usually I I switch it up, you know, but this was just a normal <laughs> standard show me the meaning. He sped it through it a... though. We we have some yeah. some lost time to make up for. Everyone in the chat's complaining. Yeah. I know. We got to make up 10 minutes in the air, boys. Let's go. All right. Let's it kind of had a little bit of some weasel energy though. So <laughs> kind of like ratty kind of. <laughs> so all right, what up? I'm Austin Hayden. I'm joined by the Show Me the Meaning crew. We got Ryan. What up, film fans? And, and we got Raymond. Hello. And I'm actually pretty excited to talk about another superhero film. I know we've talked in the past about having Marvel fatigue, but now we're going to mm-hmm. jump to the other biggie, which is DC. And we're going to be talking about the new The Suicide Squad, written and directed by James Gunn, starring fucking everybody, Idris Elba, Margot Robbie, John Cena, Joel Kinnaman, Sylvester Stallone, Hollow, who does a great fucking job, Viola Davis, Peter Capaldi, Daniela Melchior, and I hope I'm saying this gentleman's name because I actually fucking love him, but David Dastmalkian. And, yeah, so what we'll do is let's go around. Let's do this. Let's go around and do a first impressions on this. I'm assuming we've all only seen it one time. Let's talk Uh about it in contradistinction to the last one, um, the first film, Suicide Squad. Just really briefly, let's not do like a big diatribe on it, but what are your impressions of this film? Just kind of brief first impressions, and what do you think of it as a sequel um, in relation to the last film that didn't do so great? Let's start with Raymond. It's not really a sequel, though, right? So they're just, billing it it's they're kinda, billing it as a sequel. Yeah, it's kind like of a, a sequel re, it's a requel, folks. Requel. We have requel. Yet, yet another thing to add to the uh the the movie vocabulary. <laughs> um yeah. I thought this uh I thought this movie was a very pleasant surprise. Um the, the first one its reputation precedes it. It's not very good. There's a lot of uh, studio tinkering. And I think that James Gunn really benefited from sort of the, like, backlash to the backlash surrounding his firing from Disney. Uh, Mm. I think that Warner Brothers really wanted to kind of, like, stake their claim on him and say, like, oh, you know, not only are we going to give James Gunn a shot, we're going to let him do whatever the fuck he wants with this movie. And, I mean, for for better or worse, I would say for better, this feels like a James Gunn movie. Like, you, you can... You can draw a direct line uh, through uh, his Guardians of the Galaxy films all the way back to his trauma days. Um, you know, this 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 feels like it's his. Uh, the, his fingerprints are all over it, and uh, I I liked it a lot. A lot. I, um, I, I to to bring it back to the original Austin was not a fan of that one. Uh, yeah. I I I mean. It's uh, I don't know. Like you said, we don't need to get too too yeah, deep yeah. into things on that. But, but we're uh, glad yeah. we're glad that they did a requel. The the well the thing that I'm concerned about the well not concerned about I don't have a whole lot writing on any of this but I think because the first movie was so poorly received uh, and this this movie is still going to have some of that that film's residue on it. You I think we've already seen that from the uh, the poor box office performance of this one. Um, you know, this, this one for like, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty unfair, but it's going to have to live in that first movie shadow. I think it's going to take folks a while to come around to seeing this one, but when they do, they'll probably enjoy it. Yeah. Okay. Ryan, what about you, brother? So I actually never saw the first one. Everyone told me that it sucked so bad and not to see it. And I was kind of already in my first wave of superhero fatigue and the trailer didn't do it any favor so i was like i'm gonna skip that one out but i was working at wisecrack at the time and we did about a million videos uh about (laughs) it or in the world so i feel like i saw it by just piecing it together you know when i would take out clips to edit it from and stuff and everything i saw looked pretty stupid and uh uh but you know i can't really give it a fair assessment however this one Obviously is better. I mean, it objectively seems like it's better than the first one, even though, like I said, I haven't seen it, so I can't really say. But uh, but everyone seems to agree that it's better. And here's what I gave it. I, I broke it down because I have kind of mixed feelings about this movie. If I was mm. to, to compare it, like, I, I gave it an A-plus for action, violence, and gore. 
top notch, so fucking good. I gave it an A minus for vibe, momentum, tone, mm. just like you know the cool rock and roll. Uh, uh, I don't know, feeling I get from watching a good James Gunn movie. B for comedy, pretty funny, you know, not hysterical all the time. I think Guardians is yeah. funny. Yeah, some great laughs, notably when Peacemaker fucking just nonchalantly just stabs the guy three <laughs> times. From the front of the table. I mean, that's like one of the funniest things I've seen in a movie in a long <laughs> that time. That whole sequence was great. Yeah. I would say, though, that my, the main thing that hung me up is that I would say, so it has all the window dressing of a good movie, but then story-wise, I give it a kind of a C. I kind of really didn't care for the story um mm. and uh the starfish looked cool and stuff but just yeah. it, it it felt like it was subverting superhero movies but then kind of also becoming just a normal it had the plot of to me a pretty normal superhero movie um and it didn't really transcend the genre that much other than just kind of being cool and fun and a good time at the movies which is all i'm really asking for so so yeah. I, I would say compared to every superhero movie i've seen i would give it this movie an a or an a plus it's Top notch, one of the best. And then compared to just normal any every every movie, if I'm feeling bad, I would say maybe C plus. But if I'm gonna get, be a little more generous, because I did have a good time watching it, B minus overall. Okay. And to, compared to other movies, um, yeah, yeah, that's kind of my overall. Yeah, thoughts. I I was a little bewildered with this film as well. I I didn't know, you know, the girl and I were like, is it is it a pacing thing? Like, because it felt like. It, it, yeah, we're still working on 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 that one, right? Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see how we'll see how it evolves over over the episodes. Um, it, it, we were like, is it a pacing thing? Like, you know, like the action sequences were great, and then all of a sudden there would be like a slowdown and a stop to tell a joke, and then the jokes were funny. They were really funny, but I didn't feel like they always served the momentum of the story. So I think the way that I would say this from a story perspective, to me it felt a little herky-jerky, a little disjointed, that the story didn't fit with all of the aesthetic momentum vibe. The vibe was fun. Like, Sharky, King Shark, is cute as fuck. Like, Weasel, like, was really kind of funny. Um, you know, I really liked Rat Catcher, too. She, mm -hmm. I love how she was like a narcoleptic. She just kept falling asleep everywhere. I, I didn't love Idris Elba um, for whatever reason. Um, I didn't really care too much about Waller and, you know, the Viola Davis stuff. And, and it's, it's kind of weird because you would think that someone I like me who has like, on that, but I'll bookmark okay. That yeah. Bookmark that please. Like you'd think like, like the theme of American imperialism and American foreign policy, like those would be cool things. And I'd be like, Ooh, I'd really get hitched into it. But I didn't, for some reason, it just felt a little disjointed and I don't know why, but I, at one point, I was like, man, I love the soundtrack to this. I love the feel of it. And then at the end of it, even if 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 she and I were kind of like, eh, eh, eh what's going on here? I was like, but fuck, we were laughing and we were having fun. And it, it was like the action sequences were great. So I kind of I'm, – I'm still a little confused. I don't really know what I think, but people can make their own assessment based on what I just said. It's kind of like it confused me, but I also really did enjoy it. So, yeah, in terms of like – other quote superhero movies because i don't even know if this is this a superhero movie it's it's something funny um i think it's really it's really good and it's fun and i definitely think people should see it and i think it will have legs and i think sequels will be good um but yeah i just kind of I'm, I'm a little bewildered by by some of it so that was kind of my thing so okay uh we got a we got one thing to talk about that we've got bookmarked i've got a few things written down that i think we can kind of uh, a pull pull back and then i really want to ask ryan we can kind of delve into this a little bit more why do we think maybe it it is like an a plus action a minus with vibe but then c plus with uh, other stuff with story we can talk about that mm -hmm. on the other side of the recap let me just give a brief little synopsis here so basically after an ill-fated mission from team one of the suicide squad team two of the suicide <laughs> squad land on a beach in corto maltese to take down an anti-american regime now in exchange for lighter sentences the suicide squad perform black ops mission wherein if they fail to go through with it their heads will blow up due to an explosive device planted in them. The squad are basically tasked with taking down a secret laboratory which holds an experiment called Project Starfish. Now, a surviving member from Team One, Rick Flagg, happens to be discovered, found at a base camp for rebel soldiers, and after accidentally gunning down many of these resistance fighters, Team Two of the squad and the resistance fighters with Flagg team up to take down this regime. 
The team then capture the thinker, the scientist in charge of Project Starfish, and Harley Quinn, a second surviving member of Team 1, ends up joining Team 2. Now, they get inside the lab, and once inside, they discover that Project Starfish is Starro the Conqueror, a giant alien starfish-looking thing that controls its victims through smaller versions of itself. The thinker then reveals, however, that the U.S. government is actually behind Project Starfish, and the team realized that this is why they were sent there, to protect the United States' international interests. Flag gets pissed about this and decides to whistleblow, but Peacemaker stops him, killing him in order to cover up America's involvement. Meanwhile, Polka Dot Man sets off explosions and takes down this whole huge laboratory building, while the rest of the team fight with the Corto Maltese military outside. Peacemaker then tries to kill Ratcatcher 2 for knowing the truth about Starro, but Bloodsport shoots him and kills him before he can. Starro escapes the lab and starts wreaking havoc across the city, but the team come together and fight him off, with Harley Quinn piercing a hole in Starro's big eye center so that the city's rats can all come together and gnaw away at his optical center from the inside, ultimately bringing him down. The film then closes with the resistance fighters bringing in democratic elections and the squad being released from their sentences in exchange for their silence on America's shady dealings. And then, of course, we get a post-credit sequence where we see Weasel from Team One, who we thought had died in the opening sequence because he couldn't swim, getting up and kind of like wandering off funnily um, into the jungles of Corto Maltese. And then we also see that Peacemaker is, in fact, still alive as well, setting up the scene for, I guess, a sequel and... And hopefully lots of DC money, right? All right, the end of the film. Now we got to jump into an ad. All right, but before we continue, we got to give a shout out to our sponsor of this week's episode, Storyblocks. Look, you've heard me gush about Storyblocks week after week after week, and that's because they're legit. They are the complete stock solution, providing an unlimited library of over a million plus royalty-free, high-quality video, audio, and images through cost-effective subscription plans. I use Storyblocks for my YouTube stuff. Wisecrack, we use Storyblocks for our videos. They got everything because they offer affordable subscription plans and unlimited downloads so that you can get access to all kinds of B-roll footage, sound effects, music, motion graphics, etc., etc., Etc. So, if you want to get access to all the goodies that Storyblocks have to offer, make sure you click the link in the description, or you can go to storyblocks.com slash wisecrack. Again, click the link in the show notes, or go to storyblocks.com slash wisecrack to learn more about Storyblocks. Yeah, now back to the show. All right, so now before we jump into this, I also want to give a reminder that we have a new Twitter uh, account, so you can follow us, not just the Wisecrack Twitter, but actually the Show Me the Meaning Twitter. It's smtm underscore pod. That's smtm underscore pod. Go ahead and give us a follow. We're tweeting out extra stuff, comments. You can also find Ryan and Raymond and myself on Twitter as well. That's probably where I'm most active, so like, I think we're going to be talking about the show and any ideas and shit like that. Plus, you get all of our other zany shit and things like that. But yeah, so smtm underscore pod all right let's start peeling this back um let's start first with ryan why why do you think there was a little bit of like a disjoint there like like what happens when a film gets an a in action an a in vibe but like a c in story like what's going on there is it that the story that that, that one isn't serving the other like the vibe isn't pushing the story forward like it just seems arbitrary like it doesn't fit together is that the idea no, I, I I think James Gunn is such a good cinematic director just in terms of how he was moving the camera, how he treats the characters and stuff, and you know, the like we're talking about the tone, the 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 delivery of the jokes and whatnot and the performances, you know, he's clearly and I think he does a million takes like David Fincher, so I think that he's definitely knows what he wants and is and yeah. uh, and you can tell in the in the movie that it's really well put together. But it's like just that just like in all these superhero movies, that's my it, it, the the story ends up being so frivolous, and when the really you really break it down, it's just defeat bad guy, blah blah blah, and it's not really uh, uh, that. I never even remember what a lot of these movies are about. If you were to quiz me a week after I saw them, you know, to me the yeah. best example of a superhero movie, you know, with a story that I care about, which is you know the classic one, and uh, uh, is uh, Dark Knight, obviously. Yeah. So brave for yeah, saying yeah. that, but like like like, <laughs> like the 
the story is amazing. You know what I mean? Like, like, and it's obvious, and it's a character-based story, obviously. You know, the, between a uh, uh, Joker and Batman and stuff. And there's just a lot to gnaw on ideologically or whatever. And to me, that's like the template for for not you know it's firing on on every other cylinder but also the story yeah. just has so much to, to 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 munch on whereas this it's like to me the american imperialism thing was felt so tacked on and it's like and it's something that i've mm. seen before it's like ooh yeah, yeah okay america bad ooh wow you're really telling me something james gunn in the middle of this in zany trauma esque, you know, yeah. uh, you know, super uh, crazy big budget superhero movie. Like I, th- I thought that that was kind of like like uh, cheap, just like oh, you know, yeah, this isn't just a frivolous film. We're actually making a commentary if you really dig deep. But really, are they? I don't know. Like like yeah, it, it didn't feel important to me. That's just and let, me. Let, let us, do you think that because it doesn't feel important, do you think that somehow it takes away from maybe what could have been an important commentary and that you kind of just – like that because there was that like disjoint that you're kind of like, oh, it kind of like – like I, I don't really buy the the commentary or does it kind of do the opposite where you're kind of like, oh, how clever that we can make like a lighthearted kind of zany, funny, head-blowing up uh, – kind of film and it also just so happens to have a kind of heady and heavy social commentary as well no i go the first one to me it makes it less yeah it's like it's like it it, every you enjoy so much about this movie that that to when you know when it comes down to oh and here's the big twist or here's the story here's the you know here's what you're Mm -hmm. saying or the commentary or whatever it just kind of felt like oh that's what this is, you know. Okay, it, it felt like they they yeah. were kind of trying to tack it on to me, to be perfectly honest. Um, mm. It didn't feel earned. It didn't feel earned. It kind of just felt like, you know, it, it almost like they were kind of trying to go with a trend. Almost, it's like it's like. <laughs> so I don't know. That's just me. Yeah. Uh, what did y'all think? Yeah, Raymond. What do you think, dude? Um, I actually, I actually quite like that. This will probably come as no surprise to most people, but it is, <laughs> it is very, very weird to see a big. We talked about this in uh, Judas and the Black Messiah as well. It's very weird to see a big budget studio production, just not even like. Uh, honestly, this movie has a more clear-eyed perspective on America's antagonistic and oppressive relationship with Central America than most like quote unquote serious movies do, and I don't really think it. It necessarily detracts from the plot. I mean, you brought up the Dark Knight. There's a similar, there's a similar sort of uh, plot thread in that one with the um, the post Patriot Act surveillance uh, operation that uh, Morgan Freeman is saying he doesn't want to be a part of, and that Batman is kind of pressuring him into helping him into using that to help him find the Joker. And I, I mean, all that stuff was like very, very pointedly yeah. uh, taking aim at the Bush administration at the time. I don't, I don't see that much of a difference between the sort of political commentary in this movie versus that movie. Um, You might say they both feel tacked on, but there is like, you know, they go to this island for a reason. There is an animating principle undergirding both what the Suicide Squad is doing and what Amanda Waller is sending them there covertly to do. And, you know, it takes kind of the same shape that uh, Mm. covert operations do in places like, you know, Bolivia and Venezuela and Cuba, which is this like a very clear allegory for in this movie. Um, so I, I don't know that didn't that didn't detract from uh, from the movie for me. Um, that said, I can see how some folks would watch this and and maybe feel like uh, that rubs them the wrong way. But I, I think it is part and parcel with like having a character like Peacemaker, who is so obviously like the the living hmm. embodiment of american fascism uh you know i i think it's more integrated into the plot of the film than you may be giving it credit for well okay um, i'm actually I'm, I'm glad that you brought up peacemaker because to be honest like 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 uh uh i loved his whole arc his and and, and in terms of a commentary I, I i was super into the commentary of what you know peacemaker what they were going for with peacemaker which is actually very similar to the dark knight you know it's like like do we tell the 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 populace you know what's actually going on or do we protect them and you know, uh, if, mm. if the legend is better than the truth, print the legend kind of thing, you know, like, uh, uh, so I love Peacemaker's part. And to me, that actually did have some meat to the bone. And I'm not against political, you know, I'm not against them taking these social commentaries, you know, and putting them into these frivolous movies. It's just the effectiveness of it. I got way more out of the Dark Knight, you know, uh, thing because it's about Batman 
the main character of our, of our movie using a fascist tactic and and are we on board with that you know and uh, uh or not that's cool to me and then peacemaker kind of took that mantle here he's He's basically presented it as a good guy in the movie. He is a good guy, but he's doing or is he? I don't know. That's the no, whole point not. of the movie. Yeah. yeah. Okay. He's he's presented as like like I read an interview. James Gunn is like, look, this you know he's he's not like an evil guy. He's just doing these evil things in the name of good, which is his whole character. Right? He's doing you he's know? doing something he believes in. He's the he's hero doing, of his it, own story, but exactly. he's unequivocally portrayed as a villain in this film. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you articulated it better than me. Yeah, and uh, 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 so I thought that was a very interesting dynamic. But the whole, but but the rest of it with Villa Davis and just kind of America writ large's uh, role in the world, it was cool that they went. You know, at least we're trying to do something, I guess. But yeah, like I said, for me, didn't uh, feel. You know, I didn't really get much out of it. Yeah, okay, and then let's let's kick it back to Raymond in a second here because he said that he wanted to bookmark the the Viola Davis thing. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Then at the end at at the end of the film, the truth doesn't get revealed, right? Um, Flag Rick Flag wants to reveal the truth and be like, "Hey, look at what America's doing, intervening in these anti democratic actions." But they all they they claim to be um, the bastions of light and freedom and democracy in the world. So he wants to be the whistleblower. He gets killed, and then the squad decide to say, hey, in exchange for our freedom, we'll <laughs> they keep under things the rug, yeah. covered up, right? So are they really quote-unquote good guys? In a way, they do allow for the resistance fighters in that country to bring in their own democratic elections, which is great, but they do it in, in preserving the secrets, which then – seems to imply that somehow the United States is still going to be able to maintain their back channel operations yes. down the, the road. The deep state lives right? to kill another day. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Things um, are fucked. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I do think in uh you mentioned Rick Flagg. I, I do want to say that compared to the first one, I think James Gunn has a much better idea of how to use that character in this film. Mm. Um I think in the first one he's just kind of like he's just kind of a tackling dummy. He's just sort of there to to be Amanda's eyes and ears on the ground. And, you know, I don't really remember a whole lot of that movie, but I know he, he was entwined with, uh, what's her name Enchantress. So there, there was some kind of like, I don't know, goofy romantic subplot. I can't really remember it all that well, but I do remember thinking he was just sort of a generic haircut in that. Whereas in, in this one, I think he's, he's pretty fun. He, he gets to play not just the, the straight man role, but you can also tell that in the, in the years between the first and the first movie and this movie, if this is in fact a sequel, however you want to define it, he has kind of like been infected a little bit by the people that he's constantly having to play chaperone to that some of their, you know, not necessarily ideology, but their recklessness has rubbed off on him. Uh, there's that great line at the beginning when they're storming the beach where he's looking at the weasel and he goes, we, uh, we think he we think he's agreed to this <laughs> like if there is like mm. some acknowledgement that he is he is you know the the human in a in a comic book movie or he's the human in, on a team of superheroes and i think the the first movie kind of loses track of that where it's playing it so so kind of like just they're trying to be dark and gritty and it's all trying to be so grounded i'm like you've got a fucking walking crocodile on your team like you should have some fun with this goddamn movie um but to, shark, uh, yeah, yeah. This this movie is weirdly like not just a, a sort of reassembling of the first team, but it also is kind of a reassembly of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Like the mm. the the characters in this one map not necessarily one to one onto all the characters from Guardians of the Galaxy, but they have a similar team dynamic. And I I think obviously you know James Gunn's DNA may have a lot to do with that. Um, but uh, to bring it back to the Amanda Waller thing that you were uh, you were asking me about. I yeah. do like that as opposed to the first movie where she is the, – the movie treats her as this smooth operator who's always ten steps ahead of the game and, and she's, you know, this, 
this chess master who knows how to play all these people off of each other. Like this movie just openly acknowledges that she's completely fucking incompetent <laughs> and <laughs> so much. So yeah. That, and like, even the rest of her team, uh, the rest of her team are like looking at her like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah, they, exactly. finally, they stage a little mini coup inside the office. <laughs> and then by the end of the movie, after she's been knocked out by her team, she gets on the comm and says to Idris Elba, she goes, I told you I'd make a leader out of you. And you're just like, bitch, you were yeah. asleep on the floor for the entire <laughs> movie. But it's just one of those things. It's like, um, I remember in the, uh, what was the, the last J.J. Abrams Star Wars movie? What's that one called? The uh, the Rise of Skywalker? Um, yeah. There's there's a scene in that where I, I can't that movie's fucking terrible. But when there's a scene where the plot sort of convenes on uh, the the uh, uh, what's his name Emperor Palpatine, and he goes ah you're you're both here and uh, you're gonna try and kill me just as I planned. And I was like really that's your fucking plan, and he, and there is something interesting to that character that the Star Wars movies never acknowledge, which is that like. Anything at all, anything that happens, he could just say, like, oh, this is all part of the plan. I want you to kill me. Go ahead and do it. Do it. Mm. And Amanda mm. Waller is, like, that same archetype where she's she's trying to do the thing where, she, oh, no, this was all part of my plan. But because they show you so much behind the scenes in this, there's a great dramatic irony in this movie where it's like, oh, yeah, all these, like, chess masters who are, you know, pulling the strings behind the scenes, they're all just fucking clueless. And I, I really like that dimension of this movie that it... It just treats her like a complete and total idiot, and mm -hmm. uh, the, all she can do by the end of it, her entire objective in the final moments of the film is just to save face in front of the criminals that she has tried to send to their death, which uh, I, <laughs> I, I, I kind of like. I think that's right. an interesting dimension. Uh, and to, to, to that point, too, like, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about the political angle and stuff, which is, you know, part of the movie, but, like, like I do love... If I, you know, uh, I, I do like how James Gunn takes these misfits or antiheroes and stuff, and when this is like the most antihero superhero film ever, and you know, and it's like trying to find the goodness in everybody, right? And yeah. they, uh, uh, and I love how the last shot is him is what Id Idris with the the or uh, Deadbolt with the rat. Wait, is his name Deadbolt? Is that a different guy? Whatever. Uh, yeah, uh, him with the rat. Um, yeah, so oh, it's yeah, like, yeah. And, and then uh, the, the the thing with the daughter is is cool too. Oh shit! If you guys can hear me right now, just so you know, I've um, my 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 headphones stopped working for two more minutes. I'm sorry, but you can hear me. I can't hear you. No, anyway, can hear you. Great. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so long story short, I'm just I think that he does that dynamic so well. That tone of yeah, just fucked up rat, people rat. being you know uh, doing you know, finding the sweetness in it. And, and so that, that was nice and stuff. And I wish that it had kind of been more about that. The plot even had been more about that, but whatever. So, so Wally in the chat actually said this, said, you know, that, that it was about the hidden bits of humanity in people, that that's what this film was about. And I mean, obviously there are always multi-dimensional layers in any story, right? So you can pick and choose elements. And I think the bits about, um, the friendship between King Shark and Ratcatcher 2, right? Um, Idris Elba kind of like overcoming his fear and disgust of a rat, which is sometimes viewed as like, you know, they've been they've been ostracized in the animal kingdom. They've been scapegoated, right, for being the carriers of plague and stuff like that, and they are in trash cans, so rats are kind of like lowly. And then there's that scene with Taika Waititi who kind of talks about I mean, he kind of uses this great chain of being type of logic where it's like everything serves its purpose in the great ecological wheel of history and, and entities living together and the rats serve their purpose just like we all serve our purpose and we just have to find kind of our way to fit in the world and and um, whether that's an interesting idea or an insufficient idea is kind of besides the point because I think what he's definitely trying to do is is like finding that fit how do you get these misfits together how does King Shark this shark that wants to eat people how does he suspend his his impulses and become friends and have this really kind of sweet cute friendship with with Ratcatcher, and then, you know, he finds the little fishies, and he's like, oh, you know, I'm friends, you know, and he's just kind of like, this thing just wants to be friendly, and then they start, like, biting his face and shit, um, you know, yeah, and uh, and he loves the bird, and, and so there is a little bit about, like, what we could call the humanity, or the kindness, maybe, because shark, King Shark isn't really a human, and 
Um, so yeah, there is there is something about that that I think is kind of sweet and interesting that this film also weaves together, you, right? I don't think it. Yeah, go ahead, Rin. Oh, I was just going to say you mentioned that scene with uh, Taika Waititi where he essentially delivers that thesis statement uh, where he says, yeah. you know, if you can if you can find the uh, paraphrasing, but if you can find the the beauty and in, uh, in the lowliest of all creatures, and you can find the humanity, the beauty, uh, whatever in in anything, and I. I think that is, you know, that may feel, I'm sure there are some folks who would say that that notion or that line would ring hollow in a movie like this where they have, like mm. you said, Ryan, they have a scene where a guy just walks by a dude jabbing him as many times as he can with mm-hmm. an axe. Yeah, yeah. Um, but For within the, uh, yeah, within the context <laughs> of that moment, I, I remember, yeah, when they cut back to uh, Rat Catcher 2 and she's kind of holding her little rat wand and all of the vermin are scurrying out to bring down uh, the, the Starro, the Conqueror. There is, like, uh, I, I think a real kind of, it may be an affected earnestness, but it is quite earnest. Um, I, uh, I, uh, yes. I like those moments. Me too. So, oh, and uh, shout out to Google user in the chat who says, rats are amazing. As a pet rat owner, it's so heartwarming to see them shown in a good light. I would agree. Uh, I had a friend uh, when I lived in New York who had a pet rat. And it was the the sweetest little thing I've ever pet in my life. Um, I, I take that back. I've met a lot of good dogs, but it was a very great rat. Sorry, sorry. Also, go also Google user said Rick Flag is so damn handsome. I mean, yeah, it, Joel Kinnaman is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful man. Kind beautiful, of an Austin Hayden type, if I uh, if I do. Well, I mean, God myself. bless you. God bless you for saying that. <laughs> I I appreciate uh, you. Um, no, this is what I wanted to talk about. Okay, so there's something interesting that we're starting to see a little bit of. And we have tiptoed around it a little bit, but we haven't really addressed it. And I think maybe we could call it the return of the auteur. And one of the things one of the things that we often complain about is that the studio gets its hands on everything and you don't really see the fingerprints of the the creative on the thing right so so much so many people are like oh is chloe zhao's superhero film is it going to be an expression of her or is the studio going to kind of flatten it out a little bit maybe one of the reasons that this film was successful whereas the last one was not and maybe one of the things that we can kind of say the reason that the guardians of the galaxy films were so successful well maybe some of the other films within that universe are a little bit kind of flattened out is precisely because the studio stepped back and said, James Gunn, do your thing. Do your James Gunn thing. And that's why it has a distinctive vibe. That's why it has a distinctive flow, right? That's why we're all kind of like, yeah, it kind of is kind of Guardians of the Galaxy-esque in a lot of ways. So do we think that we can say that James Gunn is an auteur, even though people look love to talk about like new wave cinema like that's that's what an auteur is it has to be some art house thing can you do big budget box office blockbuster types of films and have them be within auteur uh the auteur theory world and is james gunn then an auteur the answer to the, both of those is fuck yes and fuck yes, yeah. Austin. Uh, you can <laughs> absolutely make you know there's only a handful and i really to me you know, in terms of is cinema dying to me, I think that we there needs to be more filmmakers like James Gunn that are that are like the rock stars that are bringing you to the theater just to see the director, you know, just to see whatever. Like and basically we only have a couple of those that actually can you can bank on uh, a drive in a film's box office, which is Quentin Tarantino, Chris Nolan, probably Martin Scorsese, you know, and then uh, uh, yeah. and they all kind of to me make like populist art house cinema in a weird way if you want to call it that mm-hmm. and james gunn is like a little bit more of the schlocky version of that but i love it and 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 honestly i think that that's probably more popular than um or object or demonstrably is you know with the box office receipts so yeah i think there needs to be more j- people that I, I we need to bring back like how john carpenter used to do and put his name above the the fucking marquee john carpenter's uh-huh. halloween john carpenter's big trouble in china because we need that kind of stuff to mm. yeah, make the make it literally an auteur driven market to where you're wanting to go to a movie because of who directed it, which is so rare that anyone gives a shit. You know, it's usually the the actor or just because it's some piece of IP that you've already seen. And my other my other uh, uh, strategy, which I think I used to be against Quentin Tarantino's I'm gonna I'm gonna retire after one more movie uh, yeah, yeah. strategy. I was like, 
who are you? You fucking, you know, why are you going to do that? <laughs> like, old people can make good movies too. Scorsese and William Friedkin, they're all doing great stuff. But I now think he's a genius for it. And I think that every mm-hmm. good director should announce their immediate retirement this year. Okay. And then <laughs> what that will do is have this effect of going, well, shit, all the good directors are gone. But then, you know, in a couple of years, they each one of them comes out of retirement for just one movie. So it's like the Rolling Stones. You're like, I got to go see the next Steven Soderbergh movie because it might be the last one I get to see at the theater. But otherwise, because he, oh, he promised he was going to retire. And then the next time he comes out of retirement every two years, you know, like he's already doing. And then we get people back in the cinemas again. What do you guys think about my insane evil plan to get people well, back to the movies? Soderbergh <laughs> is, a, is a great example to bring up because he's, you know, as you said, he uh, at least at least once he formally stated he was retiring from the business. Right. I, I think behind the yeah. candelabra, he said was going to be his last feature. And I really, I really do like the sort of approach he has had to making movies because if you read contemporary interviews with him, he talks about how like. Yeah, I said I was going to retire, and I meant it, but what I really knew in my heart of hearts was that, like, if this is how I'm going to feel about movies, then what's really the point in making them anymore? And I just had to find that spark again, and it took, you know, uh, he went off and did a couple seasons of The Nick, he did some some formal experimentation, and then he started, you know, sort of wading back into the waters, uh, doing some some iPhone movies, and just, like, challenging and testing himself. I really, really like that about him. It's why I, uh, I will forever respect Steven Soderbergh. He's he's the rare filmmaker that even on a big budget level has never lost sight of his of his roots. I think we you know we talked about this a lot on the uh, Ocean's Eleven episode. Um, but the question of is is auteurism back or is the auteur theory still valid uh, in in such a studio driven era, Austin? Um, I think that's definitely a a much bigger conversation, but I do see examples of that in the DC universe. And I think there are examples of it in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Um, but Marvel has... Marvel, I think, creatively has been a little bit of a victim of their own success, where they've got their formula locked down so much, and they get really, really gun-shy about stepping outside of that that frequency. Um, Yeah. Whereas I think DC, they kind of have the freedom of failure, which is that, like, so Mm. many of these movies have, you know, come out and not really connected with an audience. Or even something like the the first Suicide Squad made a bunch of money, but it had some real fool me once energy, as I think evidenced by by this movie's box office fate. Um, And so they, I, I, I can kind of feel them sort of just, like, opening things up a little bit more. James Gunn seems to have been given some creative control of this. I think one of their other best movies, or probably one of their only other good movies in, in this, you know, the DCEU, as it's known, is uh, uh, David Sandberg's uh, uh, Shazam, I think is really, really fun. And it feels like his mm. movie. You know, it's got some scary elements. It's like the Tom, Tom Hanks movie Big, but with a superhero. It's it's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, I also think the uh, the Birds of Prey movie is really good. I was and say, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and your mileage may vary with Joker. I, I know that it's been memed to death, but at, at the very least what I can say about that is it, it does at least feel like the expression of a, uh, of a narrative author. Um, yeah. And so I, I do think they're doing their strongest work in these kind of like pocket continuities where – you know, the Suicide Squad doesn't really seem to have to carry the burden of, like, setting up a bunch of other movies and tying into this Mm. universe the way that every single Marvel movie seems to have to. And Shazam is just, like, out there on its own. I don't think they've mentioned that character in any of the other movies, which is, uh, you know, kind of a surprise because he interacts with those characters in the comic books, at least to my understanding. Um, So, yeah, I I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, like... You know, I, I superhero cinema is not really my bag altogether, but it's movies like this that I'm kind of interested in. You know, I'll I'll watch another movie like this, even if it's a failure. At least it will be a compelling and unique failure. Whereas, uh, I don't know when when I'm kind of hit over the head with like the same sort of just just aiming straight down the middle kind of you know, corporate right. problem that Marvel churns out. I just, I just get tired of the same old, same old. See, I, yeah, I, kind Yash, of a, oh, sorry. Uh, I was just gonna say real quick, Yash or, or Yash in the chat said Marvel's creatively bankrupt. So uh, 
What do we think? I, yeah, Ryan, go ahead. I, I disagree with all, with kind of that and the fact that they aren't really an odd tour thing. Because to, to me, it, it's really pleasantly surprised me, the, the, the pick of directors and I, how much I can see the DNA, you know, their DNA in the movies. Like, you, you know, James Gunn is a perfect direct, uh, example. Sam Raimi is going to be doing the next Doctor Strange you know, which is fucking awesome. Uh, you, Chloe Zhao. I mean, they're getting uh, uh, Taiki Watiti. You know, is is yeah, he did Ragnarok. Yeah, and you can really see. You know, he has all these weird creatures and and bizarre humor, and uh, you can see him. So in then, the movie. but but so is this Marvel then trying to say, oh, maybe we can let go of the rain? Like Kevin Feig, is that how you say his last name? Feige. Like we can let we can let go of the reins a little bit, and we can let these auteurs have a little bit more. Do you think? Oh yeah, I mean, I think they've been doing that for most of the MCU. I mean, mm. I, I I think they do a good job of of making it a little fresh on almost every outing. It's more just like you said, they're a victim of the, their own success in the sense that it's mm. the sheer volume and amount of them where yeah. it's just kind of like okay, yeah. Even though this, I'm usually going to go into a Marvel movie and at the end I go, okay, that was pretty fun in some parts. You know what I mean? But it's like. Like it's it, there. It, it's a true fatigue. It's like there has been twenty of these twenty five fucking movies. <laughs> it's like all yeah. within the same kind of vibe. So even with, it's like they 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 give the auteurs the reins, but then they clearly are you know putting the connective tissue around it that makes it a Marvel movie. And I think that that is the thing that makes it to where you kind of are like no matter how good it is. You're like, okay, all right, another Marvel movie, let's go. Well, that's <sighs> why a film like Logan was so interesting. Because mm-hmm. Logan, to me, doesn't even feel like, is it even a part of the MCU? Like, no, really? No. Well, no. The, X, the X-Men weren't legally allowed to be part of the MCU until Disney acquired Marvel. And now they'll probably recast and integrate those characters going forward. But all those, all, all the okay. like Hugh Jackman Wolverine movies are totally unrelated to the Marvel movies because uh, Fox owned the, the on-screen rights to the X-Men. As well as the Fantastic oh, okay. Four. Like, and there, so Logan- there are a ton of... So Logan is not a Disney product. Logan is not. No, that was I think oh, okay. one well, that... of the, one of the last. I think the so... very last X Men movie uh, that was uh, produced under Fox was uh, the oh, most Fox. recent one. The um, the the Phoenix Saga. I can't remember the title of it. I didn't see it, okay. but uh, that was the. I, and I think Disney actually handled the rollout for that because it was finished, and then the Fox acquisition happened like during post production. But I, I could be wrong on the timeline there. Okay, because I personally, I'd love to see more of those types of things, right? Like branch off stories of, you know, uh, you take somebody from the Avengers, like like they did with Black Widow, but give, um, give give her a TV series that can be kind of like the Jessica Jonesy type of thing, right? Where you develop this character over a long time, or like the Punisher, like those series, Daredevil. Like I'm so disappointed that they canceled that series because I thought that those were so good. Right. I thought that they were so interesting. And to me, they felt very different than a lot of the films feel. And I don't a lot of the films feel and I don't exactly know why that is. Maybe it's because the writers have a little bit more time to develop story, character, et cetera, et cetera. But it felt like um, qualitatively unique in that space. No, Uh, I I haven't seen any of those shows, but I know that they were. They they were being licensed. I'm, I I think there's another legal arrangement where those weren't being like produced in house at Disney. Um, but okay. I, once again, I I all that stuff was so long ago now. And there's with like the the acquisition blitz from Disney over the past you know ten years. It's I I really can't say for sure. But I'm I know that there was a a different creative team who was handling the Netflix shows. And I think the reason they yeah. were canceled is because Netflix had. Netflix had distribution rights to those, and Disney just once once they had all those characters uh, and would have been handling production. I think they just didn't want to. Uh, they they didn't want Netflix to be the ones profiting off of the the the, the content they were generating. They um, want everything on Disney Plus. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, essentially, and I think that's where once again, probably not the best person to pontificate on this, but uh, shows like. Um, WandaVision, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and all that stuff. I think Disney Plus seems to be the more iterative space where they're going to kind of, like, try those more character-oriented ideas in the, the, the long sort of series format while they start ushering in their new wave, like the second generation of Avengers, for lack of a better uh, team name, uh, on the big screen. But um, I'm, also- I'm kind of, yeah. 
Go ahead. There's, well, there's also another layer to this as well, that a film like The Suicide Squad is not a four-quadrant film, right? No, absolutely not. And, and, and all the Marvel films are. Hard so, R, baby. You love it. That's yeah, one of the best parts of this hard, movie, too. Yeah, that's probably something that contributes to the freedom of the filmmaker because the filmmaker is able to be a little bit edgier. And we know that James Gunn has that edgelord provocateur past as I uh, – we talked what Kind of why talked, he ended up at DC in the first <laughs> place. Yeah, so oh, it allows – it allows the filmmaker to be a little bit more quote unquote free or true to themselves. Yeah, you know? maybe a little bit. I mean, DC also, if you, if you go back to the sort of progenitor of uh, the contemporary superhero movie, uh, I think obviously the Superman movies had come out uh, like 15, 20 years before Tim Burton's first Batman, but Batman and Batman returns really did kind of like, set the pace for superhero movies going forward until like Sam Raimi with the first Spider-Man really picked it up and, and kind of codified what would uh, essentially become like the superhero genre. Um, and those first two Batman movies are fucking like, those are Tim Burton movies. Just <laughs> like, full yeah, stop. yeah, totally. And I, I, I you know, I don't want to sound like there hasn't been, you, you mentioned Taika Waititi's uh, uh, Thor Ragnarok, which I think is a fun movie. The James Gunn pictures uh, are really good in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And I also think that after the first Avengers came out and made all the money, you can actually see the, the Marvel team relaxing a little bit. Like, Iron Man 3 is a Shane Black movie, and it's very, very oh, good. Yeah. Mm. Like, I like that one a lot. Me and too. then after that was Thor The Dark World, which I, don't, I, I wasn't too crazy about. But it does make that some sucks. weird choices, and it goes to some strange places and stuff. But it still feels like they were they had some more creative freedom, or or at the very least, they were thinking outside the box and not just trying to repeat a formula. Um, so I I do think that there has been uh, there have been great examples of uh, of Marvel iterating in the space in in unique and interesting ways. Um, and I just wish they would get, like if we're gonna get one or two of these every year, like. Just, just give us a few. Just one of them. Make half half of them give a little bit more freedom to someone who is, you know, even if it's like mm. Iron Man three was never going to be a flop. So when you have a character that that's that well established, yeah. maybe by the time we get to you know Shang Chi three, if that's a big hit, you can kind of take some chances and do something a little bit more risky or inventive. But who knows? You know, I've never I've never made billions and billions of dollars <laughs> making movies, so uh, I don't know why they would yeah. me on that. <laughs> Not yeah, yet. Right. yeah. <laughs> All right, let's do this. Um, before we move on and kind of maybe delve into the mailbag here, let's go around and talk a little. Let's bring it back directly to this film, The Suicide Squad. Let's talk about some of our favorite elements, favorite characters, favorite moments. One of the things that I really love is the music. There is, um, during the action sequences, the kind of rock and roll feel to it all was great. I also loved that uh, I, when they go into that bar and you see some of the dancers, you see Palm in, in, uh, as a dancer on stage. And I was like, wait a second, is that Mantis from Guardians of the Galaxy? Um, and the fact that she had like a little quick little guest appearance. Um, I fucking what love King Shark. I think King Shark is just fucking adorable. And it's great that Sly is in this, but he's kind of... He's in the background, but he's not in the background. So I loved that, and then I thought Weasel was like hilarious. I thought the opening sequence with uh, with Weasel was great, and it made me laugh a lot. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that we could say that we loved here. So those are like some of the little snippets that I really enjoyed. Ryan, what about you? I man? loved Polka Dot Man. Now that's the <laughs> yeah, we haven't thing. talked much about him. I, but... Yeah, and to me, that is the perfect like of them uh, example of them like like. Uh, transcending the genre in a way kind of giving me something new it's like it's it's reveling in the absurdity of these dumb yeah. characters and their names you know i love that yeah especially at the beginning when we're hearing all their names like oh well, his name's tdk what's that for and then five minutes later the, det the detachable kid his, arm the just and his arms are off of his body like i i i i, I want more of that maybe it's just because of where we are in superhero uh land but yeah like reveling in the chaos and insanity of what this is and james gunn's the perfect director to do that and i thought polka dot man and his whole arc and how and, and the best part about it is how seriously they treated it you know his name's fucking polka dot man he spits out polka right. dots because his mom you know uh poisoned him as a child 
and it's and it's not really done with a wink and a nod necessarily. Like like the guy who plays him is very looks very distraught and like holy shit, I, like the, I'm the going through a lot of pain, that. you know, like uh, uh, with with these giant glowing orbs in my body. Like uh, I <laughs> love that, and it's just up to the audience to go. This is fucking ridiculous. Um, I I remember when David Desmalchian was in, uh, and I may be mispronouncing that. Apologies if he's listening. Um, Come on the show if you're listening, by the way. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I remember he's he has a a very small role in uh, the Dark Knight. There's yeah. there's one point where uh, Batman. He's one of the I, escapees from uh, from from whatever the fuck that place is called. I forgot the name. Yeah. Of it. Arkham. And they've got him kind of pinned down, and he's kind of acting crazy and going bug eyed and looking up at him. And I remember, even though folks didn't really know him or recognize him, he's not a household name by any means. Um, but I remember folks on the internet because he has such a distinctive look and he just, he just has such a presence about him. I remember folks on the internet talking about like, Oh, was that, is that a setup for a villain? Is he maybe, maybe that's supposed mm. to be Edward Nigma. Is he going to be the Riddler? Blah, blah, blah. Yes, I remember and that. it was just one of those, I, I remember it just being one of those moments where like just through sheer force of presence, a, a sort of day play role really like broke through in a major way. So Kudos to him. I, I think he's great in this movie, and uh, he's had he's had quite a career since then. Hell yeah! Uh, uh, another moment in the movie where I was just kind of like, like, wow, this is crazy. What we're watching is 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 in the climax. Whenever Harley Quinn, you know, uh, goes through into the eye of the starfish, and then all the the fucking rats are climbing up into it and then gnawing on his uh, uh, whatever his retina. Like optical nerves and shit. It was, yeah. it was so gross and so like unnerving yeah. and uncomfortable. But I was just like, dude, this is insane. Like this is just a crazy situation. It, you know, when I think about it, log like logically and what, how how many steps it got to to get here, I was like, ah, right, this is a pretty cool moment. And and I will not forget that. I won't forget. You know. Um, yeah, so yeah. I, 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 more of those moments would be good. You, you mentioned the mu the music, and I agree with you 100%. Like, the music is awesome in the movie, but I can't help, maybe because it's, I'm an editor too, it is a little cheating, I feel like, to just, you know, it, it's like what Mar Martin Scorsese does in every one of his movies. It's uh, Mick Jagger deserves a, a writing credit on the half of his films. Because yeah, to me, Ro I think Rolling like, Stone's song is the middle square on the Scorsese bingo yeah, card. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's almost like, all right, this scene will be cool, but if I play, you know, uh, uh, Give Me Shelter here, it'll be ten times cooler. And it does feel cool. And yeah. then you, you leave the scene going, wow, that was a cool scene. It's like, no, yeah. Give Me Shelter is just a cool song. You know, like, like, and you just like watching, listening to it, to visuals. And I mean, and it works, and it, but, and I'm not necessarily giving him shit for it, but it is kind of one of those things when I watch those scenes where there's just a cool, you know, uh, mic drop, or what do you call it? A needle drop. Needle drop, yeah, moment. You're like, oh, right, this is cool. Here we are in the scene. Yeah. It's like, all right, you know, I give James Gunn about, you know, 65% credit for that. And then whoever wrote the song, like the Pixies or something, I'm like, you know, Frank Black gets okay. credit. I'll, I'll be remiss if I don't just mention this real quick as well before I kick it over to Raymond to talk about some of your favorite sequences. I really love, and maybe this would have been one of yours, but I just want to make sure we give a shout out to it. I really love the Harley Quinn scene when she's like taking down all those people and there's just like flowers shooting fun. behind yeah. her and the animals and stuff like that. Actually, Justin Diver hit me up on uh, on Twitter and was like, what's with the Disney princess flower scene with Harley in the escape scene? Similar imagery in B.O.P. What's that? What's B.O.P.? P B O P. Um, oh, Birds of Prey. Similar imagery Birds in Birds of Prey. Just being silly or seeing the fight through her eyes was the question. But yeah, I really, I really enjoyed that aesthetically. I thought that was a lot of fun, really interesting, and uh, yeah, just wanted to make sure we we shouted that out real quick. And and real quick, Raymond, before you do your thing, but, but my, uh, with that scene in particular, my my friend Greg had brought up this point. He was like, you know, if you take that scene out of the movie, it really wouldn't matter at all. <laughs> and he and he mm. in his mind, he goes, he goes. It, it seemed like just an excuse to get Harley Quinn in this ballroom gown for the rest of the movie, you know, uh, was his take on it. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting, maybe, you know, yeah, because I don't know. It really it, it was a cool, aesthetically pleasing scene that, yeah, I don't know how much it added up to the final plot of the film. But anyway, hmm. yeah, I don't know. I, uh, I thought that was a fun sequence. And I also liked um, it was a really, really stupid gag. Full, I mean, in a movie fucking full of stupid gags, but I really loved Idris Elba riding the rubble down floor yes. by floor by floor. Yes, until that was he just, cool. 
until he just stops, stops face to face with Peacemaker and then yeah. shoots him through his bullet. Like, there's there's just you know there's a lot of stuff like that we were talking before about like is this a superhero movie i don't really think it fucking matters because i think this movie <laughs> gets what comic books are in some ways kind of like kind kind of more than a lot of other comic book movies do there are a lot of really great uh moments i'm thinking of uh where the shark just grabs a person and tears them in two as yeah, like the lightning awesome. is striking you just see this this gory silhouette i mean that looks that looks straight out of a comic book. That's really, really nifty. Um, and and I, I don't know. I uh, like we were talking in the uh, in the chat beforehand about which uh, thumbnail to use to promote this episode. I liked the posters for this. It was a kind of a, a mm. fun throwback to old men on a suicide mission movies. You know, your dirty dozens, um, your uh, your wild bunches, stuff like that. And um, yeah, this it, it it just it has this vibe that I want. Like when I when I turn on a superhero movie, I I, I want to be entertained. I want to see something that's that's fun and maybe a little bit outrageous. You know, not not necessarily, but I I like that this is embracing uh, that that kind of mandate that it's it's bringing these really cartoonish ideas alive in a way that you you know you, you just don't see in a lot of uh, honestly in a lot of Marvel movies nowadays where mm. it. It, you know the action is not really distinctive uh, in a lot of marvel movies they they don't really uh, have you know big iconic moments that that jump into your mind uh the, this this movie doesn't have uh, necessarily a big iconic score i can't really remember any aspects of it but i i do think that's something uh in the marvel movies that they lack as well is like i i would love to see both marvel and dc kind of moving towards the things that were so distinctive about your your Tim Burton Batmans and your Sam Raimi Spider-Mans where they weren't afraid to embrace as much of the the goofy stuff like Marvel is really famous for every every crazy comic book thing that happens in it they kind of have to like wink at the audience and let them know that they're in on yeah. the joke a little bit that's right and i just don't think you need that i think if if you were to embrace the sort of reckless silliness that is inherent yes. to a lot of comic books these movies would be a lot more fun and i think you'd find a, a, a lot more interesting and and unique avenues in which to take them you know it's it's crazy this to film... me thinking we've had oh sorry but we've had a hundred yeah. comic book movies in the past 10 years and I can't think of a single one that has released posters that are made to look like a comic book cover. Like, how is that something that's never happened? You know, it's just, it's little things like that where I think these movies have become codified as a genre of movie, and they've kind of lost sight of what inspired these movies to begin with. And, and, and I just, I think this is a, a, a notable exception to that rule, and I enjoyed it. I think this film did a nice job of being self-aware but not um, ironically detached. And so it didn't do that postmodern shtick like Deadpool does that it really leans sure. heavy into it so much to the point that it's even like meta-ness enfolding in its meta-ness. And a lot of people have um, kind of commented that it was rated R but cute in the chat is what they're saying. And that's it. It's because it was sincere. There was a sincerity. There was something oh, about yeah. that. And then just – uh, the last thing we're going to say here is, uh, before we do just a quick little email from the mailbag, Gold Crow said, King Shark making that little bomb man, that was a great thing. And then he <laughs> was like, Peacemaker, because it was supposed to be Peacemaker. Really mm. cute. That was very cute. And then, yeah, um, AARD, Ard, was like so cute, you know, because I think everyone kind of got into that. And this was what Wally was saying earlier, that there was something about the humanity, the sweetness of of relationship in this. And maybe that's why it didn't have the kind of like – postmodern, dire, ironic detachment stuff that a lot of times you get in cinema nowadays that, that is self-aware. It was self this this film it was self-aware but without kind of falling into that irony, right? Um, okay, so what we're gonna do real quick is we're just gonna read um, an email. We got no voicemails. Mofos, give us send a us voicemails. Call. Send us, us freaking voicemails. Don't be shy. We want to hear your lovely, beautiful voices. Call us at 1-213-534-8807. That's 1-213-534-8807. Yeah, and leave Elf us Hut your seven. ramble. What's that? 213-ELF-HUT-7. That's, uh, that's that... the – and if that helps you make it uh, – remember it more. That's our Elf phone Hut, number. Elf, or Elf-HUT. Elf that's right. Or Elf-HUT, yeah. Gut, yeah. <laughs> Elf-HUT-7. Or – 
you can email us, movies at wisecrack.co. That's movies at wisecrack.co. We'll just get into an email here from Will who wants to talk about eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. Hello, all. My name is Will. I'm 21 years old and a college student from Dallas. What up, Will? Firstly, I want to say thanks for the great discussion on Eternal Sunshine. This was the first podcast I'd tune into ever, but I love cinema, and this is my favorite movie of all time. Got extremely lucky with the timing. I found it interesting that y'all and a few of the listeners agreed that this movie seems to hold great significance amongst teens, which is when I also watched this movie first, at 15. None of my friends seem to have the same regard, but they all watched it later than me. The message of my email is this. At one point, you discussed Kaufman's early drafts where, Cole, or where Joel and Clem were bound to the cycle of repeating the procedure. You said it would make the movie much more tragic and negate the theme of hope, but this is exactly how I see it. In the last few seconds, the clip of them running on the beach is looped a few times, which leads me to believe that they do make the same mistakes and erase each other again and again, but are led back to each other by fate. I still find hope and inspiration in this, but I also chose to rec choose to recognize the movie as a reminder of the significance of the past and understanding that our pain is what allows us to progress as humans. The themes tip slightly towards retrospection, then hope for the future. Our main characters just keep making the wrong choice. To explain this, I always thought Lacuna just continued operating without Mary or that another business had a similar procedure. Now listen, I think that this is really interesting, Will, and I'm glad you brought up that point on the beach because I noticed that as well because they're kind of jump cuts, but they're jump cuts that back up a little bit in a little bit of a rewind, and then play. And I think it happens three times. What do you think of Will's thoughts on this? And is there something significant in that final beach scene with those jump cuts that do kind of play back and forth? I would say that I uh, uh, think the good email, but I think it's a stretch. I think that they kind of definitively at the end, you know, don't – I don't think there's enough evidence to say that they're that they've mm. done it again like this in the script. What do you think, Raymond? Okay. Well, yeah. isn't the I I do appreciate that the ending kind of implies at the very least that even if they don't literally make that same mistake, that at the very least they may be doomed to make similar mistakes in their yeah. relationship as it evolves organically. Um, but also within the movie itself, isn't it? Isn't it implied that uh, the 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 mind wiping company is done that they're that mm -hmm. they had to fold? Um, so I don't know. I mean, you know, who's who, who's to say they may be able to uh, replicate the technology elsewhere, or you know, the company could find new footing or yeah, what or saying. whatever. Um, but uh, I, I will say that even if you do read it as an indication that they will continue to do this, they'll continue to erase each other, you know, rinse and repeat. Um, I think it is, while that has tragic implications, it's a lot more palatable than having to watch them do it over and over and over again. Mm. So that's, yes. that is, I think, the distinction there. But a really, really thoughtful email. Yeah. Thank you so much, Will. We always get such great fucking thoughtful emails from our listeners. We love it when you email us and give us your thoughts. Give us your conspiracy theories, your spicy takes, your hot takes, your deep Reddit theories, whatever the fuck you got. Call us at one two one three five three four eight eight zero seven, or email us movies at wisecrack.co and follow us on Twitter at s m t m underscore p o d. Not like the new metal band, but as in pod. <laughs> All right, we love you. Where can people find you on the internet, Ryan? Uh, Ryan Shorts about to release. Uh, I've filmed a bunch of them lately. I'm about to release a bunch. Um, you can find that on YouTube. Ryan's Game Show on Twitter. I'll be there in uh, Funhouse. You can see me on some of those videos too. Holla and Raymond. Uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter and Letterboxd. I'm at Crematoria. And uh, you can also find, uh, I mentioned this last week, but it, it just came out. Um, uh, I, I wrote a Wisecrack video about Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Very proud of it. Uh, Michael did a wonderful job presenting it. Amanda did a wonderful job editing it. And uh, highly recommend if you haven't watched it already. It's, uh, it was a lot of fun. It's really good. It's really good. Definitely oh, thanks, check man. that out. And if you want, you can find me on Twitter, Austin underscore Hayden, Insta, AUS underscore H-A-Y, whatever, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. I write philosophy shit. I have a philosophy podcast. There's stuff out there. Ryan, send us out of here, brother. Show me the meaning of me. <laughs> Copyright strike. <laughs> <laughs>